So first of all, I want to thank uh, Carol and the Center for Global Ethics and Politics for, for inviting me. I was, as Carol mentioned, I was here for two wonderful years. It really is very nice to be back. And it's a special honor to be back as a speaker uh, for the first time. Uh, also, thanks for coming. To the rest of you, you know, before a talk, I always wonder, you know, if anyone's going to come. And uh, I'm always amazed that some people do come, so thank you. Thank you for coming. So why give a talk on something as alluring as minimalism? Uh, I spent a good deal of my graduate, postgraduate years, as Carol mentioned, reading and writing about human rights, and particularly the philosophy of human rights, the edited volume that Carol mentioned is a kind of combination of all those, those efforts. And one of the truisms or axioms you encounter, or one encounters over and over again, I'm sure some of you dipped into this a little bit, have noticed this, is the idea that human rights are in some important sense minimalistic. Uh, so for instance, Henry Hsu, who's probably one of the most eloquent defenders of this idea, claims that human rights are, quote unquote, the morality of the depths. He says they protect us from the worst rather than provide us with the best. They prevent atrocity rather than promote the good. That's the core idea of what I'm calling human rights minimalism, or, or, or minimalism as I want to understand it. And there are various different ways of working that idea out. So that's sort of the rough idea. There's various ways of working it out, which I'm going to sort of spell out with you uh, in, in a moment. But what I want to say as a start is that, like many other people, I originally found the minimalistic hypothesis very appealing, uh, deeply intuitive, almost obvious. And not only that, it also seemed to me to match up very well with human rights law, including uh, the 48th Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a blueprint for covenants that came afterwards. So for instance, if you read the first 20 articles of the Universal Declaration, you get a list of core civil rights, you know, to non, sorry, against discrimination, uh, rights to life, liberty, and security of person rights to property and national citizenship, to freedom from torture, slavery, and arbitrary arrest, and against unfair trial, and so on. And these seem like minimalistic rights, uh, if any are. And they also fit with the common assumption that the Declaration is a part a kind of moral reaction to the atrocities of the Holocaust. No it's actually me calling it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a way, of sort of, you know, this sort of common notion that the Universal Declaration was a way of collectively saying never again. Um, and, you know, those were exactly the kinds of rights violated by the Nazi regime, after all. But the Universal Declaration has other rights, uh, other articles as well, and I began to think a lot more about those after reading Samuel Moyne's much discussed. I think Moyne gave a talk again five years ago in, in this room or the next room. And I was reading his work when it came out in, in 2010, and I started paying attention to the other articles uh, in the Universal Declaration and, and in other documents. So Moyne thinks that early human rights documents, like you know early early 20th century, so the Universal Declaration, weren't so much a response, a moral response to the Holocaust, not so much about atrocity, as they were a kind of ideological victory lap for the North Atlantic allies and their favorite political ideal, social democracy. And I think many people, myself included, find, find that, found that analysis somewhat deflating. Um, and that's part of what you know, stirs up a lot of controversy, at least the, the deflation that people are, are responding to. And I do wonder what Ralph Bunch, uh, who was involved in, in the drafting process, would have thought about that analysis. Of course, the Center for Global Ethics and Politics is housed with him. Rough Bunch Institute. Um, but for myself personally, I have to say that analysis opened my mind a little bit. It allowed me to, to read the Declaration in a way that I hadn't before. And in particular, I started to see in a more open minded way how maximalist, how socially democratic uh, that document really was. So, for instance, uh, among the rights included in the Universal Declaration, are the right to free and universally accessible higher education. This also appears in the 66 Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. 
The right to education directed at the full development of the human personality. And that's a phrase that comes up multiple times across the Declaration. <coughs> the right to join trade unions. The famous or infamous, depending who you talk to, right to rest and leisure and periodic holidays with pay, um, which also appears in the International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. The right to enjoy the arts and share in scientific advancement and its benefits. Intellectual property rights, rights to one's culture, cultural practices. And it's not only the Universal Declaration that flirts with what you might call maximalism. Since 48, the, the human rights movement and human rights law has only become more ambitious. Uh, so just a smaller sampling. In the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, it's always a mouthful. You have the right, famously, to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. You have, in the same document, the right to the continuous improvement of living conditions. You have the right, in a non binding resolution of the Human Rights Committee recently, to secure internet access. And you have the right of children to grow up in a family environment, including in an atmosphere of happiness, love, and understanding. This is in the Convention on the Rights. Child. So these are just a few examples. There are plenty more. Uh, and you know, these are all important rights. I, I think these are all human rights. Uh, but the point is, it's hard to see how they could plausibly qualify as minimalistic. Um, they seem more like entitlements to a good life, or even to a just society, you might say, than protections against calamity or atrocity. They just don't have that flavor. So this, this is what raises the big question, the basic question that I wanted to address today. If human rights law is so ambitious, why is human rights theory so dogmatically minimalistic? Why do theorists so regularly assume that human rights must only be concerned with atrocity and the bare essentials, when practitioners clearly link them to quite a bit more? What explains that divergence, and can it be justified? So those, those, that's my big question, and I'm going to try and address it in, in three steps. So the first thing I want to do is spend a little bit of time going over the varieties of minimalism that one might come across in the philosophical literature, just so you get a better hold of the idea and how, how it's actually spelled out by, by particular thinkers. Then I want to offer some possible explanations of why it's such a popular idea, why everyone finds this just completely obvious in the theoretical world, in the philosophical world. Um, and third, I want to see if any of those explanations have justificatory power. So once we get some sense of the reasons why uh, minimalism might be so popular, I want to see if any of those might qualify as good, philosophically sound reasons. Uh, so I'm asking both explanatory and justificatory questions. I'm going to mix a little sociology, history, with a little philosophy as we go along. Okay, so let's start with the idea of minimalism itself. So firstly, you can be a minimalist about different things, different aspects of human rights. One option is justificatory minimalism. So this is the idea that human rights are or should be grounded in a minimal set of non-controversial values and or ideas. And there's, of course, a, a sort of vaunted Rawlsian tradition here so one way of being a justificatory minimalist would be to ground human rights in some kind of ideal or public reason. This might be a liberal public reason, which assumes minimal values of fairness, cooperation, freedom and equality of all persons, and excludes so-called comprehensive doctrines. Or it might be what Joshua Cohen has called global public reason, which grounds human rights in, this is in an article called Minimalism, about human rights, the most we can hope for, I think 2001, or something like that. And that, you know, he thinks if you ground human rights in global public reason, they're grounded in this universal value of political membership. It's kind of minimal, minimal idea. Another form of justificatory minimalism, minimalism involves thinking of human rights as having no official grounds at all. So this would be something like what the Catholic intellectual Jacques Maritain uh, imagined in his introduction to this 1947 uh, UNESCO agreed to the theoretical foundations of human rights. So this was going on while the drafting of the Universal Declaration was taking place. It was commissioned, and Jack Maritain was running the inquiry. 
and in his introduction to, to the findings, the conclusions, you know, they were trying to this, you know, how, how can we form an agreement on these human rights? What are, what are their philosophical bases? So he said, look, everyone agrees on the norms, famously he says this, on the condition no one asks why. So, no, so the idea here is that you have a bare agreement on norms and no agreement on the grounds of those norms, what justifies those norms. That, that's the kind of model that you might have, justificatory minimalism. If you're not a justificatory minimalist, you might instead be an implementational minimalist. It's not it's not a great label, but it's a label I just came up with because it seems like a conceptual possibility. And this means uh, that you think the implementation of human rights should be minimized or limited in some important way, and there are again various options here. So you might think human rights are best implemented exclusively through popular morality instead of law. There's a lot in the Universal Declaration actually about education educating the public about, about human rights. Maybe you think that's all that matters. Just get people to believe in the rights and that will be enough to, to secure them. If you thought that was all that was necessary, then you might be kind of a uh, moral minimalist or anti-legal minimalist about, about human rights. Or you might accept that human rights should be pursued and implemented through law, but think that primary legal authority should be given to legislatures instead of courts. That would be kind of legislative minimalism. Um, and it's gaining popularity. Cambridge University Press uh, recently published an entire volume defending this view called Legislating Rights. <coughs> it's very interesting. Um, the third option, you might accept that human rights should be implemented through law and monitored by courts, but think that the law should only be enforced by non-coercive means or soft power. So economic and political sanctions or naming and shaming, but never military intervention. That would be a kind of enforcement minimalism, likely attractive to pacifists, but not only pacifists. Some might you know, be attracted to that idea because you know, they, they see on contingent grounds that state actors and international actors as they are, and for the foreseeable future, are not trustworthy enforcers of human rights, and so we, we should not be entrusting them with that responsibility. That might be a view that I think many people uh, would be attracted to who aren't otherwise pacifists. Finally, jumping to another category entirely, there is substantive minimalism. So this is minimalism about the content of human rights, and it's what I'm interested in here today. And the rough idea is, again, that human rights should be narrowly concerned with calamity or atrocity, with preventing the very worst human harms rather than promoting the good. There are many different ways of working this idea out, many different substantive minimalisms, so let me just offer you a small sampling uh, of what you're likely to find in the literature because I think this will help you appreciate just how popular uh, minimalism really is as an idea. And you know, forgive me if this gets a little bit pedantic <coughs> and down in, in the details. First, you might be what James Nichol calls an ultra-minimalist. So this is simply the idea that there are very few genuine human rights, or at least vastly fewer than what you see in international law. John Rawls is an example of an ultra-minimalist, so he thinks there are only four human rights. This is what he argues in the Law of Peoples. Life, liberty, property, and formal equality. That's it. You might be a linkage minimalist. So this is, this is someone who thinks human rights are basic rights. This is a technical notion that comes from Henry Hsu's work. A basic right, as he sees it, is a right that's necessary for the enjoyment of any other right. So it's linked to the enjoyment of any other right. Shu thinks basic rights include mainly the rights to security and subsistence because we can't realistically enjoy any moral or legal entitlement as he sees it. I think he's right about this. Unless we're first healthy, fed, housed, well-clothed, and safe from attack. That's the second option. Third option is what you might call urgency minimalism. So here I'm thinking of Charles Bites's understanding of human rights as grounded exclusively in urgent individual interests. There's also James Nichols' claim that human rights are categorically high priority norms. The contrast here is, of course, with non-urgent or low or mid-priority norms, and it's hard to know exactly how the contrast is meant to be worked out. But presumably it's going to exclude uh, most, if not all, of the ambitious human rights I mentioned earlier uh, in, in the Declaration. So, for instance, 
you know, within the totality of a state's obligations, it's not distinctively, it's not a distinctively urgent matter for the state to provide citizens with the highest attainable standard of health. It's of course very important that states do this, but what's clearly urgent or high priority is that the state first provides citizens with, for instance, basic levels of health care that meet essential needs or emergency needs. And that's exactly what the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights recognized when they famously distinguished between, for instance, the progressive realization of the right to health and other human rights and what they called minimum core obligations. The latter, these minimum core obligations, pick out minimum essential levels of health care that must be provided now and for everyone. And achieving the highest attainable standard of health, as they saw it, committee, that's understood to be a longer, more graduate goal, so precisely non urgent uh, in their view, although important. Those are three options. Here's a fourth option. This is what you might call agency minimalism, and it's the idea that, to quote one thinker, instead of a good or flourishing life, human rights guarantee only the more austere life of a normative agent. There are several prominent theorists in this camp. Carol uh, is one of them. Is, you're mad. <laughs> Are you to talk about agency? I distinguish the two. Longer, longer discussion. For the Q&A. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> James Griffin. I'll take the reference. I'll take anything. <laughs> <laughs> James Griffin uh, is maybe more uh, strict uh, agency minimalist. Michael Nadia is, is another one. Alan Gorth. You might also think of Martha Nussbaum as an agency minimalist of sorts. Uh, she thinks of human rights as protections of what she calls basic human capabilities uh, to live, reason, affiliate with others, engage in play, imagination, and pleasure. But I, you know, I think her view is complicated, at least so far as categorizing it as minimalist is concerned, because she links it to an ideal of flourishing and, and human good. A fifth alternative is what I'm going to call decency minimalism. And this is the idea that as James Nichol puts it, human rights guarantee not a good, excellent, or flourishing, but only a minimally good or decent life. And that's an extremely common view. Uh, you hear it a lot, not just in philosophical literature, but also in public and popular discourse about human rights. The idea that the aim of human rights is to make life tolerable, or decent, not good, or great. It even has a currency in human rights practice, and, and by that I mean the law. Uh, so if you think about the language of adequacy you often encounter uh, in, in human rights documents, as in the right to a standard of living adequate for health and well-being, or the right to a decent living, this is in the economic, social, cultural rights, economic, social, cultural rights. That seems to evoke some kind of minimal decency threshold. Another option is needs-based minimalism. So this is the idea uh, defended by David Miller, for instance, that human rights protect not interests or preferences, but only basic human needs. And that's not all. You might also be what, for lack of a better word, you might call a sacredness minimalist. And this is the idea defended by both Eva Brems and Elizabeth Ashford, that unlike other rights, human rights, or the duty not to violate them, have a kind of special, sacred moral force as Brandis puts it, this is a quote from her, human rights express what is most valuable, most sacred, and should not be touched upon. It's not clear exactly what that means, but I think we all understand the idea, and, and um, it's not an unpopular one. Uh, I think a lot of people find, uh, see something intuitive in that. And it fits with the sort of general idea that violating human rights is just about the worst thing that you can do uh, to another person, a contravention of those kind of most sacred moral taboos that we, that we have. So that gives you seven minimalistic op theoretical options. So you have drastically reducing the number of human rights, reducing them to basic rights, to urgent rights, to the mere conditions of agency, to the conditions of decency as opposed to goodness or excellence, to the satisfaction of needs, as opposed to interests or preferences, and to the expression of uniquely sacred uh, moral norms. So the fact that it's relatively easy to come up with seven uh, options that are established in the literature shows how popular um, minimalism is as a theoretical position. So now, 
time uh, to ask why. Why are so many people, why are so many theorists attracted to uh, this kind of picture of human rights? So now I'm going to think a little bit more about the explanation for minimalism and its popularity, as well as about the justification for, for this. So one standard explanation is really not going to work, or at least not straightforwardly in this instance, is that minimalism is motivated by the common desire to be faithful to the practice, and especially to its legal component. So that, that's a nearly universal goal among uh, human rights theorists. And the main problem is, of course, that minimum, the main problem is that minimalism is not a plausible feature of human rights law in particular. It's not clear why anyone reading these documents would come away thinking that human rights are strictly minimal demands. So it's true that certain varieties of minimalism may have an easier time matching up with extant human rights law than others, but I think it's going to be a real stretch in all cases. There are other aspects of the practice, though, that theorists might want to be faithful to. And that, you know, this may, way, may well help explain uh, what's going on. So, since their inception in the 1960s and 1970s, the most famous human rights advocacy groups, and I'm thinking of Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, have practiced what's sometimes called informational politics, so the public naming and shaming of human rights violators. And in general, they've adopted a strategy of focusing on the most egregious, most nameable and shameable human rights violations, torture, genocide, blatant discrimination, corruption, political assassinations, things like that very high-profile events. And this makes sense if, as Kenneth Roth, the executive director of Human Rights Watch, puts it, we think of these organizations as having a limited moral capital and limited operational resources. So these institutions need to get the most bang for their buck, as it were. I think he uses that very term in, in, an, article defending, in an article defending this. And focusing only on egregious violations, only on calamities and atrocities, as opposed to less grievous offenses, plausibly does that. It's plausibly the best or most pragmatic use of their limited political capital. So it could be that in embracing minimalism, theorists are trying to be faithful to the minimalistic focus of this prominent activist aspect of human rights practice. Uh, but I don't think that's the best explanation of what's going on. I think what's more likely is that something more indirect is happening. So Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have, through the power of their advocacy work, shaped our popular understanding <coughs> of human rights. And this has to affect uh, theoretical work. So my sense is that we're so used to hearing about human rights violations of this sort that Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International report and advertise that we've commonly come to think of human rights in those terms, as essentially rights of that sort. And theorists are perhaps inadvertently giving voice to the common understanding, to that common understanding in their theoretical work. I think that's one explanation of what's, what's going on. There was sort of, there's a seepage uh, from what we hear in the news into our general sort of folk conception of, of human rights, and then that ends up, again, seeping into theoretical work. And that explanation, if it's right, happens to fit well with Samuel Moyne's history of human rights, too. So in Moyne's view, of course, famously, human rights only acquired broad popular currency in the 1970s precisely through the work of organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. It was, in Moyne's view, because human rights, as practiced by those institutions, were unambitious concentrated only on atrocity and what he calls minimal constraints on reasonable politics, that they were first able to break through and speak to an ideologically disenchanted public. So maybe theorists and members of the public continue to instinctively think of human rights in this minimalistic 1970s, one puts it, human rights watch frame, even though the law itself has long been more ambitious, having mostly been written before the 1970s before this revolution. So I think that's quite a plausible explanation of what's going on. But it isn't much of a justification. You know, for all the sociological and historical plausibility of that um, analysis, it's not clear that it gets us anywhere philosophically. 
So first, if theorists are going to be faithful to the practice of human rights, as they call it, there's no reason why they should only focus on its activist component, let alone that activist uh, component. There's, after all, plenty of human rights activism that isn't minimalistic. Even Amnesty International, uh, since 2001, has incorporated less prototypically minimalistic uh, um, advocacy into their, into their practice. So they, 2001, they said, we're also going to advocate for um, violations of the Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, for instance. Um, and second, even if it's true that human rights became popular on account of some kind of perceived minimalism, uh, that isn't in itself a good reason to think that they're, in fact, minimalistic. So much, that's, that's kind of fidelity to the practice explanation I'm going to put to one side. Another very different reason to be minimalist is to, take, is to make human rights determinate. So after all, human rights practice is often accused of indeterminacy, of proclaiming rights haphazardly, uh, uh, or without rigorous justification, and also in an imprecise manner without sufficient attention to practical details about what exactly such rights require and of whom, it's here that minimalism might seem to be of some use. So by limiting or narrowing the aims of human rights, minimalism promises to first establish explicit justificatory criteria against which human rights claims can be judged, and also to clarify or at least limit, hopefully to a manageable level, the content of the obligations generated or imposed by uh, these rights. So I think the desire for determinacy certainly helps explain the turn towards minimalism in many cases. So James Griffin's work is one clear example of this. His main concern is with conceptual indeterminacy. We don't have really any clear idea of what is and is not uh, a human right. And he turns to agency minimalism as a solution. But again, I think the philosophical argument here is, is pretty crude. Maximalist theories of human rights, if you want to call them that, can be determinate too. Uh, so for instance, maybe my theory of human rights guarantees uh, all persons everywhere a minimum income of 40,000 American dollars a year. It's, it's an ambitious goal. Uh, it's certainly not minim minimalistic in any way, but it's highly determinate. Um, so I think this argument falls apart in the end, at least as a justification. Another argument is based on concerns about feasibility. So human rights are supposed to be achievable, otherwise how can they impose genuine obligations? You can't be required to do the impossible, uh, we, we standardly think. And if we take that thought seriously, minimalism becomes attractive. After all, the less human rights demand, the more likely it is that their demands can be met. Some thinkers uh, Maurice Cranston is, is an obvious example, have clearly been pushed to minimalism on those grounds, and perhaps it's a, an important motivator in, in many cases. But philosophically, again, I think this is uh, a crude argument. The scope of what's, strictly speaking, achievable by humanity for human rights purposes is always changing, and in any case, it's clearly very broad. So strictly speaking, it would be feasible, for instance, for humanity to pursue an ideal of global equality, that is to try to equalize wealth, the distribution of wealth, across all members of the human population. That's a feasible uh, goal, at least long term, but it's not a minimalistic uh, goal. It's much more ambitious, in fact, than the sufficientarian demands you find in human rights as we currently uh, understand, particularly in, in international law. So feasibility doesn't necessarily require uh, minimalism. And though it's true that you, know, you have to make sure that the totality of human rights demands as a whole is feasible, which means that you have to make sure that no one right or set of rights is so demanding that it's incompatible with the fulfillment of others. Still, it's at least not clear that you need to be a minimalist in some sense to achieve that, to make sure that the total, the total set is, is feasible. So I think whatever explanatory work uh, this argument does, I think we ought to treat arguments from minimalism, from feasibility, uh, with a healthy dose of skepticism, or at least caution. Uh, a feasible conception of human rights can likely stretch beyond the boundaries of minimalism. Um, 
Still, concerns about feasibility are connected to another final set of concerns that may well do some justificatory work. And this has to do with the political, what I'm going to call the political viability of human rights. So human rights ultimately require domestic implementation. And there's some reason to think that that kind of implementation will be more viable if human rights first have controlled implementation costs, which don't exhaust or overwhelm the resources of a majority of domestic polities. Second, human rights will be more politically viable, presumably, if they have a narrow focus, leaving plenty of room for a broader domestic decision making. That might be a requirement of respect for democracy, some people might say, or for uh, domestic sovereignty. And third, Human rights will be more politically viable if they maintain a degree of political neutrality or avoid partisanship and accommodate various political platforms and ideologies. That's a kind of broad acceptability requirement. So by demanding less, a minimalistic conception of human rights seems likely to be more politically viable in all these ways. Limit, limiting costs, respecting domestic, domestic sovereignty, and achieving broad acceptance. So this is a serious argument, I think, in, in, in both an explanatory and a, just, and a justificatory sense. But let me add some notes of caution. So first of all, theory can serve many purposes. Not all theories of human rights need to be concerned about the political viability or acceptability of their proposals, although there's nothing wrong with many theorists uh, being concerned about this. If what you're trying to do as a theorist is formulate recommendations about the content of human rights law, then it probably does make sense for you to be thinking very carefully about the political viability of your proposals or theory of human rights. But if your interest is broader than that, if, say, what you're trying to do is formulate a morally justifiable and appealing understanding of human rights, of what sort of goods are owed as a matter of right to all human beings, then it would be odd if political viability was at the top of your mind. In fact, I think moral theorists are fully entitled to place concerns about what are called political viability to one side when they're, when they're doing their theorizing, at least in the first instance, if they like. And in any case, you know, philosophers are probably going to be bad judges of political viability, particularly given you know, the abstract nature of their work. Generalize. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it might be wise for philosophers to avoid that uh, anyways. But let's say you know, we are trying to formulate recommendations about the content of human rights law in particular. And so you know, we're bound to at least take political viability into serious account. So let me end by saying something about whether we'll be forced into the arms of minimalism in that restricted case. First, I think what I said earlier about feasibility applies equally well to the concern about limiting implementation costs at the domestic level. It's not clear that cost considerations require abandoning any aspiration towards the good or towards something more than just a decent or minimally tolerable life for one's citizens. As for the concern about making sure that human rights have a narrow scope or focus, so that domestic polities have enough room to decide important matters of justice by their own lights, that, I think, is a more complicated issue, but here, too, there, there are a few things to say. One is that member states are, of course, entitled to submit reservations to any international or regional treaties they ratify. So, of course, this happens often. If you have an ambitious international human rights regime that conflicts in some respect with a domestic political belief or practice, states will sometimes cope with this by entering a reservation uh, during the treaty ratification process. Another point is that even ambitious human rights norms can be implemented or interpreted in different ways. So a right requiring the provision of comprehensive health care can be satisfied by a single-payer system, a multi-payer system, or some subsidized private alternative, something like Obamacare, uh, maybe, all with different costs and benefits. And a state obligated by that right can at least decide for itself how to go about fulfilling the right, right? What policy mechanisms they put in place. And that's true of all human rights. Some states think uh, fair trials require the use of juries. Some states do not. That's entirely fine. Uh, that's up to the state itself. Another relevant point, if, if, 
is that you know, if what you're really concerned about is making sure that the human rights regime balances the values of protecting individual rights and respecting domestic sovereignty, and I think you have to accept that it, it just is an open question how best to do that. Whatever the answer is, it's not obviously human rights minimalism. Maybe the best overall solution is to verge on the side of protecting and promoting the individual human good rather than the sovereignty of groups. Finally, let me say something about uh, the importance of political neutrality, or what I call broad acceptability, the third requirement of political viability. This has clearly been a motivating factor for many. So just to bring it back to activism for, for a second, um, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have understood their very credibility and political efficacy to depend on their political neutrality, their unbiased journalistic integrity. These organizations, they do all they can to ensure that human rights stand above the political fray. And peers, too, understand that you know, the worldly success of human rights is going to depend, at least in part, on their ability to gain the acceptance of a very diverse set of parties with different world views, etc. And again, you know, minimalistic construal of human rights seems advantageous uh, in that respect. The less human rights demand, the more likely it is that diverse parties will ultimately agree on their content. And this is serious. You know, think, for example, of how damaging it's been that climate change has become a partisan issue. That has slowed things down. And it wasn't always the case. Uh, the ozone scare in the 90s wasn't a partisan issue. It was a bipartisan. Both sides, both parties, uh, recognized it as a problem that needed to be solved. So surely, that's something you want to avoid, right? Uh, turning human rights into a partisan creed. If, if you can avoid it at all, you'd like to. And it does seem like minimalism might help human rights avoid this by focusing human rights on strictly self-evident moral, moral wrongs, the wrongs of which nobody can deny. But again, uh, I think there's need for caution. Total political neutrality is, of course, impossible. Uh, like it or not, human rights are a partisan creed when it comes down to it. And as ideological tides shift, both within, between societies, the neutral ground is always changing, right, from year to year, month to month sometimes. In the 30s, 40s, and 50s, social and economic rights were, you know, quite broadly accepted in the United States, not as much anymore. Maybe that will change uh, in a few months. Uh, of late, you know, numerous leaders, so Jair Bolsonaro, Donald Trump, Rodrigo Duterte, have vocally advocated for the use of torture and punishment without trial, in some cases, which makes opposition to those practices partisan, all of a sudden, in a way that it wasn't uh, before. So given that you know, perfect neutrality is impossible, uh, I think the goal of any theory that, that seriously is concerned with political viability should be to achieve a kind of balance between, I suppose, moral plausibility on the one hand and political neutrality on the other. You're trying to manage these two competing uh, considerations. And again, I'm not convinced that we need to be minimalists in, in, in any of the senses I've described to properly strike that balance. I think it's quite possible that the ambitiousness of human rights law has enhanced rather than set back its political success. And further ambition, perhaps in an egalitarian direction, might well boost human rights law further for one, because it might help uh, you know, uh, believers in human rights law defend themselves against uh, common criticisms about its complacency in a world of structural injustice and rising inequality. So I'm thinking of you know, Moyne's, Moyne's recent book, Not Enough. Uh, and in any case, you know, I think the reasonable strategy you know, would seem to be to try to be as ambitious as the limits of political viability will allow to try and grab on to as many maximalist, morally plausible prescriptions as one can and put them into the law, which is, I think, probably a good description or a good analysis of what you see in human rights law itself. Just a grab bag you know, of, of, of the most we can get, um, given the limits of what, what uh, states are willing to agree to. 
So that's all I have to say. Hopefully, uh, I've offered some plausible explanations of why minimalism is so popular, despite leaving some doubt as to whether any of them count as real justifications. And hopefully you agree that there's nothing obviously wrong uh, with this piecemeal ambition of human rights law as we know it. Hopefully now you're definitely convinced, if you weren't already ready, that already, already, um, <coughs> that less is not always more. Thanks. Of 
what I think is the moral truth. Um, so that's one reason I think to preserve to preserve the language because they allow you to articulate this idea of being wrong, you know, by something which which makes the you know it's not just a bad thing. It's, it's, a, it's a wrong against the individual person. Something that they were owed. So that's part of the attraction. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's enough to fully answer your question. Hopefully not. Yeah. of your inquiry at that point. So you're, gonna, you're not going to want it to be maybe too far off from 
uh, from the current content. It's going to be statist in character, the kind of obligations that you formulate, because of course these are international treaties and we're, we're binding states and, and things like that. Um, but again, you might have a different focus. So maybe I'm just thinking uh, for myself, maybe as a theorist, you know, what do we morally owe to each other as human beings, period, without thinking about you know, what the law should say. Uh, then, you know, of course, there will be practical considerations of what human beings can do for one another. There will be feasibility limitations and practicalities you have to take in mind. But this is sort of what James Griffin does, right? He just thinks, well, uh, we need to respect each other's agency. And it's kind of pure, purely moral inquiry, and that's going to be governed by different uh, criteria. So I'm not someone who thinks that theorists should be doing one thing or another. I think theorists are free to do whatever they want to do. They can criticize, uh, they can think about the law, they can think about morality, um, and you know, different possibilities will allow you to be more or less imaginative and, and free in, in, your, in your thinking. Uh, yeah. So like, okay, so maybe want to feel like, what do we owe one another? Or do you may ask for Jim, because we talk, talk about, okay, what, what, what's considered wrong? That's like a pretty broad aim. And yeah. in a way, I think you can think of that's kind of the aim of political morality more generally. Mm -hmm. Why do we need to shoehorn human rights as like we frame for us to cash that out? Like, well, I was just going with the theory of justice. And that's also what we owe one another. And just maybe part of it is human rights, but it does have to be completely flushed out by human rights. Yeah, so I want to yeah. just piggyback on this question because I think it, you could put it even more radically. That, um, I'm not really sure, I mean, your talk was kind of Oxford style, where you're considering the existing views out there, and you just sort of very limited way show that none of those arguments are entirely conclusive. Mm -hmm. But I don't see how you could ever get a conclusive argument for, the, for anything beyond minimalism without actually giving an account of human rights. <coughs> I think that's what's missing. That's a sort of more radical version of John's question. Because it might still be minimal depending on your view of human rights, which you know, we don't know. Why should it be maximal? We need an account of that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, anyway, that was just to sort of. Um, yeah. Well, I guess, you know, both, both difficult, challenging questions. The, the Oxford style one is a tough one. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I, like it. Take I it, admire yeah, it a lot, but it's just inconclusive. Because it's, yeah, you know, it's the art. I, I think that was not my quite work, yeah. period. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I don't, I've never felt uh, the need to come up with a theory of human rights of my own. I mean, partly because I think there's just so many things you could try to do and you, you might want to do. So I, I find it persuasive to think of human rights as universal rights, so universal moral rights. So they are the set of rights that all human beings are owed. In each case, uh, human beings in each and every case have. And of course, you know, some, some rights are not like that, some rights are special rights. Donald Trump has a special right to veto Congress, we don't all have that, so it's not a, it's not a human right. Um, but some rights do, do have this universal uh, characteristic, and those are human rights. So that would be my simple-minded view. Um, Let's hear some more uh, interventions, Susan. Um, also, uh, on this topic of your theory of human rights as maximal, it seems that you tacitly have this theory, or you're suggesting uh, human rights conceived as maximal. Um, it's not just about uh, freedom from the worst atrocities, or just a decent life, but a good life. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could say more about that. What, what does it mean to have a right to a good life? Because in my mind, a right to a good life is something that uh, no one can actually give you. You know, in Aristotelian sense, it has to be something that you have worked very hard for and you achieve. Mm -hmm. um, me and Carol have talked about the idea of um, the right to love. I thought that might be an instance of a maximal human right, the human right to love, to have somebody to, not to love, to be loved. Love. Yeah. The human oh, right yeah. to this is my view. Referring to that yeah. Um, yeah, the human right to be loved. And um, the first thing I thought of, well, who has to love you? No one wants to love you, but you have a right to be loved. Um, 
it just seems that uh, no one has a right to be loved. You have to be the kind of person that people want to love. You have to treat others in a way that uh, you have to treat them with respect and empathy and yeah. earn that instead of just having a right to it. So if you can say a little bit more about that to me. Care. Yeah. Eva is well, 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 thanks. I mean, I worried about that formulation for that reason. It's very vague to say, you know, not just about the trust seeker, but some, but, but a larger ambition of, of providing people with a good life. I use that as a proxy to sort of capture a lot of different views. So I don't think there's actually much content to, to that general formulation of minimalism. I would just say, if you want to flesh that idea out, use one of the minimalistic theories that I mentioned to do that. So if you were a needs-based minimalist, um, the distinction you would draw would be between satisfying needs and satisfying preferences or wants. So this larger category of aspiring towards you know, providing people with the good would be about satisfying interests or preferences rather than just needs. So it's just different ways of caching that. I don't have my own view, but I use it as a proxy to capture various different types of views. I hope that's, that's helpful. Stuff about the right to love, I find very interesting. Did you? So Matthew Lau is. Yeah, he's, I mean, he has a whole book on that. I mean, he, he does have an answer to that concern. I mean, he distinguishes between different kinds of love. So romantic love, yes, it would seem odd to have a right to romantic love, but something like paternal love, he suggests, between the father and the mother and their son and daughter. That's something you know he thinks you can be obligated to provide in certain material ways, time, attention, uh, concern, care, things like that, and the manifestations. So, but I did want to say one thing about about the, the Oxford style. My my aim really is to just disrupt, you know, because I think it is a dogma. People come away thinking, oh, human rights are just about the very essentials. Yeah, it's, it's valuable. I didn't mean to. And I just want to poke holes in that idea, so so you can sort of think a little bit, you know, breathe a little bit more. Deeply, uh, when you come to human rights. Um, okay, sorry. I have a So I, um, I, I really like the Oxford's, whatever side. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> That's great. I think it's a great question. The one, I'm not sure if this is what, a, if this falls into one of the seven types you mentioned, but I, I wanted to check. So I thought, I, um, I thought it was thought of human rights is minimalist maybe in not in the sense of providing a bare minimal, minimal or like a minimal list but um, conceptually being conceptually minimalist is deriving from a single principle um, so like those rights that you have just by virtue of being human um, right. and not um, yeah. not you know treating people like animals so, and those can be quite extensive or maximalist, substantive. So, another example would be utilitarianism is conceptually minimalistic with one principle, but of course you can drive an innate duty that is maximally um, oppressive as a moral theory, right? Or duty imposing. Uh, so, I'm wondering if, because um, I take it where you think where you think that. Um, the bloat is in in actual human rights law is in things like the right to leisure, the right to the why that's not fair to them. But those are things you might argue that those are rights you have by virtue of being a human being. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I think that's a, it's a good it's a cool distinction to, to think about sort of conceptual minimalism about human rights and I guess what I, what I was referring to is sort of substantive minimalism, so minimalism about the content. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, but I didn't think, I, that was yeah. one I thought was closest, but I didn't think that was exactly the same. Um, well, I don't know, maybe it is. I don't know. Yeah. What? Well, substantive minimalism. The substantive, yeah, what you're calling substantive. Yeah, no, I think it's different from this conceptual, uh, conceptual minimalism. But I wonder what, so you think conceptual, conceptual minimalism involves thinking of human rights as grounded in a, in a single value? It's it's derived, yeah, yeah. Dr derived from, from a single principle or value. From a single principle, yeah. Yeah, so just by virtue of our humanity. Yeah. The fact that we're human. So like human dignity or 
Yeah. Um, and that, then you get you get you can generate this list, which of course can be maximal, sure. right? Sure. Yeah. Be maximally robust. Sure. Yeah. Um, but I think conceptual minimalism, as you described it, as you say, is fully compatible with sort of substantive maximalism. Yeah. yeah okay. Absolutely. Hundred percent. I think that proxy of you know thinking the rights that we have simply in virtue of being human can also uh, contain quite a degree of pluralism depending on how you cash that out. Uh, so you mean in the in the subset like the list of rights that you might get? Yeah, you might. That might, might point you to that might point you to various grounds, right? So various interests that human beings have. Sure, but it might also meet the desiderata of why you have human right, like it's it's nonpartisan or pluralistic, like yeah. if it's acceptable. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It might be that one. Maybe not the other. Yeah. Side. And I guess it's different from justificatory minimalism too. But I need to, I need to think about that. Hopefully. Let's go to Callum. Yeah. Thanks. Well, cool. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, this question is about the like the philosophical justifications for minimalism or the alleged uh, justifications for it. Um, I thought what you had to say about about the, there is the indeterminacy of worry and the feasibility worry. I thought that, that, that was kind of compelling. Um, I had a worry that a, a minimalist might respond something like this: uh, that rights correlate with duties. And if we switch our focus to the duties, then these problems are going to come back with, with maybe a, a bit more trouble. So with something like a right to life, it's easy to spell out the correlate duties, right? You, each individual person has got the, the duty not to kill me. Um, but with the more ambitious rights, it's kind of harder to spell out who it is who has the duty and exactly what the duty is, right? If it's the, one of the the more ambitious human rights you mentioned was the right to tertiary education. Right? Yeah. I mean, my thing is, it's it's hard to spell out what the not what the right is, but what the what the correlative kind of duty is, and that that might be a kind of for example worry. Uh, and then, kind of secondarily, you might also worry that you're going to have kind of demanding this problems kicking in here on the duty side. Um, so these more ambitious rights are going to generate overly demanding duties such that we're going to end up having to kind of convict people of, of uh, kind of transgressing other people's human rights for, for doing apparently, uh, for, for apparently like not engaging in what we might have before thought of as supererogatory acts or something like that. Um, and that kind of depends on how you spell out the correlative of duties, but at least you might worry that when they get spelled out, they're going to be really demanding and there's going to be a problem there. Yeah. Yeah, no. It, that's, uh, you know, and I worry a lot about those sections because you know there's a lot of complexity there that that you know I haven't probably haven't thought hard enough about, and certainly not in this talk didn't, didn't go into enough detail about. I mean, any even the minimalistic rights again, this this some I mentioned in Virginia are going to be heavily demanded. So even the right to life, right? Does that involve? Um, Right to rescue, and in that case, does that mean you know we should you know, sort of the Singarian dilemma, famine happens, and there's all kinds of people in trouble all over the world right now. Uh, their rights to life are at stake unless we do something. And potentially, you know, people very far away from us. That's already quickly becoming a very demanding uh, right when you think about it more more globally. So there are going to be problems of demanding this feasibility, however you cut it. I think that was my, and it just, I'm just sort of poking and to say, you know, it's not clear where the line is going to be. It's not necessarily going to help simply to say that human rights are only protections against atrocity and calamity. Uh, maybe we can reach farther than that. I don't know what the what is feasible for humanity to pursue, but for instance, you know, even global equality, it seems it's, it seems feasible and so I mean maybe it would be some people would predict there's economic damage that might fall from that. Maybe not, maybe it would be the opposite. I don't know. These are all complicated questions. But they should be decided in advance by just saying, you know, by theoretical fiat. None of this is our concern if we're human rights uh, differential in human rights. Uh, well. uh, thank you very much. Um, I guess I'll 
are seven uh, different uh, conceptions of sort of substantive minimalism for, for, for human rights. Um, and I was trying to work out if these were uh, genuinely different conceptions of a minimalist account of human rights, or if these are just different semantic ways of expressing the same kind of idea. Um, so I, I guess what I'm wondering is, would there be practical situations in which uh, an agent concerned with preserving human rights who had a, who was an urgency minimalist, would there be a practical situation in which their way of going about preserving human rights was different to that, so uh, for example, uh, a needs minimalist? Um, or, 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 or anything. Yeah. I mean, certainly there's going to be overlap, you know, in some cases. Maybe it turns out that uh, someone like Nikola who says, or Bites who says, you know, this is all about urgent interests, urgent needs, ends up uh, coming upon the same list of rights as someone who's sort of just thinking about needs as opposed to interests or preferences. It's hard to say, it's hard for me to say in advance, but, but certainly even within the agency camp there's a great variety of difference. So, you know, Carol's view is this sort of complex notion of agency that's much richer than, for instance, Griffin's view, which is very narrow. Uh, and then, you, you know, it depends how you spell these notions out, so they're very flexible, which you can end up with different practical demands depending on how you work the ideas out. So, I don't think they're all just different ways of saying the same thing. There, there, there are going to be uh, practical differences between, uh, between, between the various, even within, you know, uh, these, these various camps. So, I wanted to uh, ask you just um, first of all, just to by the way, my view is that, that it's useful to distinguish between basic and non-basic human rights, but it's all human rights. Um, and I have a principal difference between them, but I don't want to be articulating my own view. Uh, I'm big into the free development of individuals, so, which you mentioned, which I think you tacitly went to as well. But anyway, my question is just a narrow one about one particular justification or reason that people might want to advocate a minimal uh, view, which is not my view necessarily, but I just, what is missing? Actually, it's not very common among philosophers who tend to be sort of liberal often like narrowly restricted to like Griffin to liberal individualism as it's practiced in the US and the UK and not elsewhere. But the uh, the desire to advance a more cross cultural approach to human rights. We didn't directly take that up, so I wanted to just mention it as one of the reasons that people might want to be relatively minimalistic in the sense of trying to reach across uh, from a perspective or make room for perspectives that are not uh, uniquely their own, especially to the extent that human rights, a lot of the social and economic ones make reference to institutions that would realize them as actually part of the human rights themselves. So you have to find a way, if they're going to be universal, to uh, at least open up the interpretation of them, if not yeah. um, expand the list both. Uh, or, I mean, or not expand it, but rather reduce the claims in some way so that they won't be exclusionary. So the desire not to exclude other cultural perspectives is one reason that theorists, especially outside philosophy, actually, and some other fields are actually attuned to this consideration more than philosophers are, that they want to reach out to Confucian approaches, and make room for that, maybe. Maybe it's impossible in that case, but some aspects of it can certainly be incorporated, right? And so that's my question, just yeah. why wasn't that in the list? Yeah. Is this minor, sort of? You just add it. Yeah. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> no, again, that's, that's uh, a concern that, you know, surprisingly, given how much I worried about this, uh, I was worried about ethnocentrism, right. and I should, you know, um, I should have a better answer, but I mean, part of my worry is again, you know, it's just an endless game, right? Trying, trying to accommodate, you know, the various views that are out there. If you, if you look for the middle ground, you 
you know, again, it's always shifting, it's always changing. And so part of my instinct is just to sort of stand your foot down for what you what you believe in and and hope that um, you know, other other world views, other cultures. That you would have to be self-critical. At the very yeah. least, you would have to be self-critical about the degree to which you might be just drawing on what's comfortable from your own yeah. culture. Yeah. Right? So that would have to be added to your putting your foot down. Yeah. Self-critically putting. Yes. And again, there will be, so even if you had a, I mean, I guess my hope is just that you could have something more ambitious that, okay. you know, that, that was an advancement of the good or about the good that, you know, uh, various cultures could could agree upon. And in cases where they didn't, again, there would be the reservation of So if we're thinking about the law, you know, you could submit reservations to, to clauses that. Social security and things like that are very institutionally defined, so you do want to leave it open to a tribal exactly. way of Providing. Yeah, and there will be different ways of doing the same thing. Right? So that's that's another, another option. Thank you. Eva, did you want to talk about care? Okay, as a human right, the care as a human right. So, so my <coughs> uh, my concern is uh, <coughs> that uh, look, one person might view it as maximalist, as another's minimalist. Um, and uh, it um, it doesn't entirely uh, it's not entirely clear to me uh, how one makes that distinction. Uh, how one makes that distinction between the individuals and the Take the right to care. I think of my human rights that should be both. <clears throat> the right to receive care, as you need it, and the right to give care, to provide care. Uh, but, um, and I actually put that for minimalist. <laughs> um, that might look to others like the maximalist. Uh, And another, another point, you know, it's interesting that you talk about having um, uh, Carol's made the point that minimalism is attractive if you're trying to go across culturally um, so that you can get some core things that work across culturally. But I worry about um, how uh, looking at this minimalism um, is in one way really most viable if you have a very specific norm of what constitutes the human. What a norm of what constitutes the human. Um, so that I think a uh, uh, conception of human rights um, profoundly expanded even when you start to take into consideration the Convention on the Rights of the City for today, um, for the rights of the aged. Um, so that, you know, again, uh, what constitutes the minimalist that we often think of as a substantive minimalism um, uh, actually just carves out one conception, one more. Uh, and doesn't really take in the whole uh, spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so, so that would be maybe one way of of, of, of arriving at or sort of approaching the idea of, of minimalism. Think of it as sort of concerned with certain aspects of humanity, certain vulnerabilities, certain needs, but not not all. Um, about about the first point you mentioned that you know one. One person's minimalism will be another person's maximalism. I think certainly that's true. I think the formulation that I gave, you know, atrocity versus the good, um, uh, is a kind of, I'm, I'm sort of getting to sort of folk understandings there. You know, we, we have a sort of folk image of what the minimal set of, of rights is, you know, rights against. Yeah. But even there, I yeah. mean, uh, What's an atrocity 
with the uh, stripping person of their ability to practice their religious beliefs, which it's not quite the same kind of atrocity as torture, but you know, to a highly religious person, it's torture. Uh, so even 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 when you go to the atrocity level, um, it's not all that clear. You need to have uh, a, a clear distinction between the individuals. No, I think it, it's very difficult to have a clear distinction unless you have a, a theory. So some some of those seven you know options were you're getting closer to that and then, then you can come up with specific answers but but the general idea itself you know these are just vague terms and you know, people will interpret them in different ways but that's that's it's helpful for me to think about that yes I, I'm kind of dying I, I'm not familiar with this literature and I'm certainly not a philosopher as Carol knows but I'm dying at apply different ideas, what you're saying, just as a thought process. In a formal life, I was a mathematician. And mathematicians classify problems by their level of complexity. Whether they're solvable, they're known to be solvable, they're not sure that you think it might be solvable, and there's some way you know it cannot be solved. They're going to be complete, they're both. And it's sort of a function of the level of complexity, but also the level of effort that it will take to solve them. And so this, this, these class, this mathematicians try to classify these problems to find out if they're worth trying to pursue. And I'm awfully curious if some of the minimalist things that you discuss are minimalist because they have, even if they might be difficult, there's a kind of a known ability to be able to do them. And some of the ones that are considered to be maximalist and tend towards an infinite complexity and perhaps an infinite cost. Well, we know the problem exists, we know we can't solve it. I wonder if there's a scaling of these rights that fit along the level of human complexity that makes them possible or impossible to achieve. A different kind of yeah, classification yeah. methodology. Yeah. As I said, I'm ignorant, I'm afraid it's a naive question. Yeah, no, it's not. It's, it's, not, it's perfectly reasonable. Perfectly reasonable. I think I would have, I was very much attracted to that idea until I read Henry Shu's work, again, which I've repeated a few times, even if we think of just the right to life, right, that's a prototypically minimalistic right, securing it, realizing it for every person on the planet, again, it's a mathematical problem, practical problem, not a mathematical problem, part maybe not, but yeah, just stupendous. Level of complexity. So immediately, you know, what I thought was a minimalistic right balloons into this. It's uh, easy to say. It's easy to say, but to again, the fact, once you get to the level of obligations, it's just, it's enormous, the, the, the problem. And, and then you just repeat that for every rank. So I don't think it's going to work in the end, uh, but, uh, but it's, it, it's certainly plausible and attractive. There's one example I'll give you. There's a group that I'm working with that says that there is a right to have open space. You should be able to go outside. Right? So, yeah. The difficulty of applying that right to different levels of society, some places, you know, there's a marginal cost that might be okay, and in other places, it's practically impossible. You know, the complexity level would be infinite to, to try yeah. to achieve. And I'm wondering, before we try to apply these rights, do we know the scale of the problem that we are trying to apply it to, as to whether or not that gives us a priority? It would be an interesting method to, to try to adopt. You know, philosophers aren't very good at it, probably because we don't know enough about the world. You know, we're just so stuck in our so stuck in our head. But I think well, it's I mean, interesting. mathematicians are theoreticians. I mean, you know, they take how many possible combinations of things are there, and then if at each one, each duty, and at each right was correspondent, how many of them are there? The trillions? Okay, that's a number. Yeah. Are they infinite? That's different. Yeah. I'm just saying it's the class. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the thought. Uh, well, I think we can move to the next uh, next stage of our discussion, which will be over wine and cheese and salads and stuff like that, up on the fifth floor. So please join me in thanking Adam for a very stimulating. <laughs>